you very, very much. Wow. It is wonderful to be with so many good friends here in California. I want to thank your chair, John Burton, for his leadership and for the great things that together you are making possible here in California. Give yourselves a round of applause. I also note that we gather here today on International Women's Day. And as President Obama so rightly said, when women succeed, America succeeds. And you have some tremendous women leaders here in California, like Senator Dianne Feinstein, Senator Barbara Boxer, Attorney General Kamala Harris, Secretary of State, who we just heard from, Deborah Bowen, and I am especially proud to be here with one woman who, in particular, has never known the meaning of the phrase glass ceiling. She is a daughter of Baltimore, House Democratic leader, the first woman ever to serve as Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi. It was also good to spend a little time with your governor, Jerry Brown. Once one of California's youngest governors, he was missed and needed so very much that now he's going to be reelected with your help as California's wisest governor come November. It is easy to govern in easy times, but Governor Brown has governed in the toughest time and he's taken on the toughest challenges, and California is moving forward. Under his leadership, he's turned deficits into surpluses, and California has become an engine of job growth again. He's also been a leader on high-speed rail, combating climate change, ensuring safe, reliable water supplies for the future of California. And when any of our states succeed, the United States succeed. So this is positive, positive news for our whole country. Look, it is um, a humbling honor to be with all of you this afternoon. And I want to talk with you this afternoon about the story of us, about the story of Baltimore and California, the story of Maryland and America. The year that I was elected mayor of Baltimore, back in 1999, my city had become the most addicted and the most violent and the most abandoned city in America. And at one of the very first community meetings that we organized in a very hard-hit neighborhood of East Baltimore, citizens assembled to talk to their new mayor, to talk about crime and justice and public safety. And yes, therefore, of course, there was tension in the air. And a little girl came up to the microphone and she said, Mr. Mayor, my name is Amber and I am 12 years old. And because of all of the addicted people and drug dealers in my neighborhood, there are people in the newspaper who call my neighborhood zombie land. And I want to know if you know that they call my neighborhood zombie land. And I want to know if you're doing anything about it. You see, there was a big difference in those days in our city between the Baltimore that we carried in our hearts and the Baltimore that we saw in our headlines and on our streets. And our biggest enemy wasn't even the drug dealers or crack cocaine. It was a lack of belief. You see, there was a culture of failure that had too many people assuming that there was nothing that could work, nothing that could be done about it, and all of us had countless excuses for why none of us should even try. So when I was elected, we set out to make our city work again. We saw trash in our streets and alleys, so we picked it up every day. We saw open-air drug markets, and we began relentlessly to close them down every day. 
We saw neighbors suffering from addiction, so we expanded drug treatment and got more people into recovery every day. And after a year of hard-earned, hard-fought, about life-saving progress, we then turned a bright light directly on the heart of despair that had been gripping our city for far too long. And we launched a campaign that we called simply but powerfully, Believe. The first ad was a four-minute commercial, which the local affiliates agreed to air simultaneously. And it showed the plight the life of a 10-year-old African-American boy in the city of Baltimore who, on a very tragic day, loses his sister, his little sister, to drug dealer crossfire in a drive-by shooting. A young girl, her lifeless eyes wide open, lying in a pool of blood. As the cameras flash on black and white civilian and police faces grieving, you hear a narrator's voice say, the people of Baltimore are in a fight. It's a fight for their future. It's a fight that we've been losing one life at a time. The narrator continues. There are some who say it's over. Give up. We've lost. But for the strong, for the brave, this fight is not over. What will it take to make us stand together and say enough. And then come the stark white on black words, believe, believe in us, believe in yourself, Baltimore, believe. Now for three very painful and uncomfortable weeks, we ran those ads. Why? To change the culture, to awaken the great spirit of a great people to make our city a safer and better place. And then we ran ads, calling people to real individual actions. Mentor a child, an hour a week can save a life, call 1-800-BELIEVE. Join the police department, believe in yourself, believe in us, call 1-800-BELIEVE. Get someone you love into drug treatment, it works, there's more of it, call 1-800-BELIEVE. And it did work. The people of Baltimore rallied. Of course, now of course, you know it wasn't about the bumper stickers and it wasn't about the signs. It was about something deeper. The belief we share that there is no such thing as a spare American. Over the next 10 years, Baltimore achieved the biggest reduction in part one crime of any major city in America. And the point, the point is this, that belief is important because belief drives action. And today, like Baltimore in 1999, we as Americans are going through a cynical time of disbelief. A time when a lot more excuses and ideology than there is cooperation and action. We seem to have lost, haven't we? That shared conviction we had once, that we can actually make things better together. There's a big difference today between the America that we carry in our hearts and the America that we see in our headlines. The America in our hearts is the land where those who work hard and play by the rules who get up early in the morning can make a better future for themselves and their children. The America in our headlines, though, is too often a place where corporate profits are higher than ever, the rich are richer than ever, and the paychecks of working families, hard-working families, are becoming smaller and smaller. The America we carry in our hearts, it remains that nation that created the greatest middle class in the history of the world. But the America in our headlines is a nation where too many kids can't afford to go to college and too many college graduates cannot find a job. And it reminds me of the story of the prize fighter who finds himself in the ring, beaten against the ropes, 
getting the worst of it, pounded down by his opponent time and time again. His trainer finally gets the chance to sit him down in the corner and he looks him in the eye and he says, you know, the problem isn't what the other guy is doing to you. The problem is what you're not doing for yourself. Whether we think we can or we think we can't, we are probably right. And I don't know about you, but I've had enough of the cynicism, I've had enough of the apathy, I've had enough of us giving in to self-pity, small solutions, and the low expectations of one another. Let's remember who we are. For 235 years, we've been the country that thrilled the world and led the world over and over again, and we did it in large part by making ourselves stronger at home. Don't you think it's time that we did it again? When others said it was impossible or it couldn't be done, we made it happen, and we made it happen together. America is the greatest job-generating, opportunity-expanding nation ever created on the history of the world. And while our country certainly works best when both of our parties are actually working, we as Democrats have an urgent responsibility today. It's about jobs, it's about a stronger middle class, and it's about giving our children a better future now. The truth is, the truth is after Hoover, America needed Roosevelt. After Eisenhower, we needed Kennedy. After Reagan, we needed Clinton. And after eight miserable years of George W. Bush, America needed Barack Obama. No president, no president since FDR inherited a, big, a worse economy, bigger job losses, as many wars or as large a deficit as President Obama inherited. But thanks to his leadership, thanks to your work, thanks to the leadership of Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic members of Congress, America is moving forward again. But there's a problem, isn't there? There's a problem. Our House of Representatives has become very unrepresentative. And these Tea Party Republicans, funded by their wealthy economic royalist friends, have a very small view of the idea of America. And, and we've seen this before, haven't we? Hoover called it supply-side economics. Reagan called it trickle-down economics. George W. Bush called it focusing on his base. We call it selling America short. The patriots who made America great, the pioneers who settled California, they didn't pray for their president to fail. They prayed for their president to succeed. They didn't belittle science and learning. They aspired to it. They didn't appeal to America's fears. They inspired American courage. And they would never, ever abandon the war on poverty in order to declare a war on women, a war on workers, a war on immigrants, a war on the sick, and a war on hungry children. The real the real and very serious question that we have to ask ourselves, that we have to ask one another as Americans is this, how much less do we believe would be good for our country? How much less education would make our children stronger? How much less opportunity will ensure that our next generation succeeds? How many hungry American children can we no longer afford to feed? We will not solve our problems, my friends, by doing less. We must do more. 
The stronger we make our country, the more she gives back to us and the more she gives back to our children and our grandchildren. <laughs> California Democrats, progress is a choice and job creation is a choice. In Maryland, we have answered our president's call to make better choices so that we can achieve better results together. We've done more, not less, to employ our people and build up a modern infrastructure. We've done more, not less, to create new jobs in emerging industries. We've done more, not less, to improve our children's education. We've done more, not less, to make college more affordable for more families, freezing, by the way, college tuition for four years in a row. And, we, and the, result, the result of those things and more is more jobs. Since the recession, Maryland's achieved the fastest rate of new job growth of any state in our region, the highest median income in the nation. We are one of the top two states for upward economic mobility. And for two years in a row, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, hardly a mouthpiece for the Maryland Democratic Party, has named Maryland the number one state in America for innovation and entrepreneurship. And this year, because like you, we believe that no one who works full-time should be forced to raise their children in poverty. We are going to raise the minimum wage in Maryland. We have set the highest goals for minority and women's business inclusion in our state, and last year we actually exceeded those goals. And to make sure that the children of our newest American immigrants will be able to realize their full potential, we pass the DREAM Act in Maryland. And while we wait for Congress to answer Leader Pelosi's call to fix our broken immigration system, we passed a law in Maryland to enable undocumented immigrants to legally obtain driver's licenses. And today, our state has achieved the lowest unemployment rate among Hispanics of any state in America. But progress is more than, than cuts and investments, isn't it? It's also about building a more inclusive, open, and secure world, that world we seek to make together for our children. Because we believe in the dignity of every human being, we pass marriage equality in Maryland. <clears throat> and last year, we passed the most comprehensive gun safety laws of any state in the nation, including an assault weapons ban, licensing, and universal background checks. And together, we've driven violent crime down to 30-year lows. And last year, together, we repealed the death penalty in Maryland. And because, like our neighbors in California, we realize that climate change is very real, in Maryland, we are doubling our renewable energy, accelerating energy conservation, and we're moving forward with Atlantic offshore wind. And it's working working to reduce energy consumption, working to reduce carbon emissions, and working to create more green jobs. What we stand for is what we stand on. Progress is not some magic trick. Reform is not a mystery. You know and I know that these things do not happen by chance. They happen by choice. Hope drives belief, belief drives action, and action achieves results. I leave you with this final story, and it is this. When my son William was nine years old, we found ourselves at home together watching the History Channel, and there was a special on about Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. And as William watched this story as a nine-year-old, he turned to me and he said, Dad, back then, 
by which he meant sometime between the extinction of the dinosaur and the arrival of eight track tapes. <laughs> Back then, let me get this straight. Somebody told you guys that some people had to ride in the front of the bus and some people had to ride in the back of the bus, and you guys actually listened? <laughs> and I said, William, I, I know it's hard to imagine, but that's the way it had always been. And then he turned to me with the clear wisdom of youth, and he said, Dad, back then, didn't you guys know that you were all going to the same place. <laughs> the truth is, the truth is we are all going to the same place. And we are all on the same bus. California and Maryland, Wisconsin and Mississippi, and we will move forward or we will slip back together. We will succeed or we will fail together, and we will rise or we will fall together. We cannot allow ourselves to become the first generation of Americans to give our children a country of less. This is not a matter of wishing or hoping. It's a matter of believing and taking action. We are Americans. We make our own destiny, and it means that California must stand up. It means that Maryland must stand up. It means that each and every one of us must stand up. It only takes one person and then another to stand up and say enough. Enough finger pointing, enough obstruction, enough wasted time. No more shutting us down, no more selling us short. Let us achieve like Americans again. Let us lead like Americans again. And let us believe like Americans again. In ourselves, in our nation, and in one another. Together we can, together we must, and together, California, we will. Thank you very, very much.